Africa. Turbulent time in politics recalled now. BBC Two continues to chart the recent history of the Labour Party in the wilderness years. Late in the evening, on the 2nd of April 1981, a rumour swept through the Palace of Westminster. Tony Benn was about to challenge Dennis Healy for the deputy leadership of the Labour Party. It must have been 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning and everybody had a few drinks. And I went to him, I found him in his room and I, I said, look, Tony, don't do it. You know, we, we don't need this. You won't do yourself any favours because it's divisive and it's in your own interest. It will not do you any good. But Tony Benn was determined. The deputy leadership was one step away from the leadership itself and the challenge was allowed under the new party constitution for which he had fought. Dennis Healy had never faced an election for the deputy leadership. He got it unopposed when Michael Foote became leader at the end of 1980, so he'd never been elected. Uh, there had then been the conference where it was decided that there would be an electoral college, so a candidature then was a natural thing to do. Tony announced that he was going to stand in the wee small hours of the morning while we were debating, I think, one of the British telecommunications bills, and he just went uh, upstairs to the press association at night watch person. Um, and gave them a statement to say that he was going to stand. It's very typical, really, of Tony's idiosyncratic approach to politics. Once he'd announced it was too late to stop him. And, of course, a lot of the Tribune group were very angry, including Neil Kinnock, who also had his eye on the potential leadership in future. I was absolutely furious. Um, I mean, from time to time, you're angry in politics in any case, but I was incandescent. It was such a destructive act. Uh, Michael had been elected in November 1980. The party was destabilized by the so-called uh, Limehouse Declaration, the beginnings of the SDP and all the rest of it. And along comes Tony declaring in April 1981 that he was going to be the candidate of the left. And it couldn't be anything but disaster. The Parliamentary Party was in a state of high neurosis uh, at this uh, stage in any event. Uh, that I think you could almost describe the two years between 81 and 83 as, a, as an institution, a very important political institution, uh, having a, a collective nervous breakdown. In the spring and summer of 1981, the Labour Party organised the People's March for Jobs. Its purpose was to draw attention to the plight of the unemployed under Margaret Thatcher. The demonstrations were the inspiration of Michael Foote. He wanted the marchers to unite the party under his leadership. But instead, Foote and his deputy, Dennis Healy, presided over a party which came close to collapse. The really sad thing about Michael's leadership was that the party split. First of all, it split in that there was the tearing away of the Social Democrats. And secondly, there was the way in which, for example, Ben behaved. Ben, who claimed to be a supporter of Foot. I fear we got it neither way with Michael, and I was wrong, because I thought Michael would be a unifier and he wasn't, though he did his very best. Tony Benn and Michael Foote were both men of the left. They had been political allies and close friends over the years, but now they became bitter enemies. Foote, desperate for unity, was ready to work with the right. He saw Benn's challenge to Healy as a threat to the party's very survival. 
He was so enraged by Ben's assault on the deputy leadership that he made a public demand, challenge me, not Healy. When he stood against uh, Dennis Healy, uh, that was not, in my opinion, that was a rather cowardly act because if he really wanted to make the challenge, if he really thought I was doing the job wrongly and if he thought that he was the chap to do it, well, he should have stood against me and he could have done and that would have settled the issue. If he'd been elected, he would have been able to carry through his policy. He wouldn't have been elected, in my opinion, in any case, but that's the reason, I think, why he didn't stand. Is this a matter of personal combat? Is it the World Heavyweight Boxing Championship? I uh, accepted nomination to stand for the deputy leadership. Why aren't you taking on Mr. Foote? Well, I support him as leader. I supported Michael when he stood against Dennis Healy last November. And the campaign is about issues. What about how to get out of the common market and how to stop American nuclear bases and how to get back to full employment. And there's very wide support, you know, in the country for the policies. Not about personalities at all. And this idea of challenge me, you know, it's all this approach to politics in terms of personal combat without any regard to what's really at, at stake. So it was, uh, it was distressing, but it didn't surprise me because as I honestly believe Michael had been put there by the parliamentary party that would have preferred Dennis Healy in terms of their political sympathies, but they felt that Michael was necessary because of his left credentials to stop the left and he was performing the function for well, which he'd been elected. The house today because we've got the nationality bill. In an effort to prevent Ben going ahead with his challenge, the party leadership mobilised union bosses, traditionally Labour's power brokers. When he said he was running for deputy leadership, he um, came to my office for lunch. He said he liked lunch in there because I always had good kosher uh, salt beef, an egg and onion, and thin latkes. And uh, when he had um, finished, he said, can I have some tea? I said, yes. And uh, the lady who was head of my secretariat brought in a loving cup. He gave me a beautiful little mug, which I have at home, which said, don't do it, Tony. Elections are a poison chalice. Did indicate the very strong tradition of fixing. Everything's always fixed in the Labour Party. Don't discuss it, fix it. And I think that's one of the things that's wrong. And uh, the denial of people of the right to participate is something that really characterised the right of the Labour Party. He said, no one's going to ask me as gracefully as this to not run. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to run and take it in the mug anyway. <laughs> the People's March for Jobs, to Michael Foote's fury, became a platform for the deputy leadership contest. Ben's strength came from the deep support he attracted from the grassroots of the Labour movement. At the time, it seemed crystal clear to me that we needed a big change. And the only man who offered the big change was Tony Benn. We didn't listen to people who said, don't make a challenge. And the reason we didn't listen was because we profoundly believed that we had to have a big change. Um, and there was no question uh, about that. It was, in our minds, absolutely necessary to take off in a new and different direction. The party was organising marches and rallies against unemployment throughout that period. Uh, all of them became uh, almost a hustings for the deputy leadership. People were excited and enthused. First of all, the idea that they had something to say that mattered. And secondly, that here was a, a senior national politician specifically taking up issues of poverty, of common ownership, of industrial policy, those kind of issues. And it surely was a very exciting time. It is a march for human dignity and against those forces which still try to persuade us that men and women should be crucified on a cross of gold in the name of monetarism and profit and loss. And we will not accept that. I've never forgotten in Wolverhampton uh, where we had this meeting. We all went into the church and the spinners sang in the church and then we came out. And then some fascists turned up and the women there got round the fascists and danced and sang around them and silenced them. There was no aggression at all. They just went round and they sang. It was tremendously powerful. I mean, you mustn't think 